Emeritus Dr. Winston H. E. Sweet from UE engages. In his wisdom, our past and present he connects engages. Our clarion call for discourse, it roars, it rages. Reparations. For descendants of enslaved Africans suffering the rages of ages. From history's pages, echoes of 400 years of injustices and cages. A call for justice for those who in chains built nations, enduring trials, tribulations, humiliations. From pain and despair, resilience emerged in generations. Reparations. Reparations. So, July the 7th, mark the date. Baizabad Community Center, we open the gate. At 4 in the afternoon, we address this heavy weight. Check the door. You check the door. It resonates. It is the voice of Amrobi, sparking, shaping the debate. Our distinguished speaker takes the stage. Professor Emeritus Dr. Winston H. E. Sweet from UE engages. In his wisdom, our past and present he connects engages. Our clarion call for discourse, it roars, it rages. Reparations. For descendants of enslaved Africans suffering the rages of ages. From history's pages, Echoes of 400 years of injustices and cages. A call for justice for those who in chains built nations. Enduring trials, tribulations, humiliations. From pain and despair, resilience emerged in generations. Reparations. Reparations. So, July the 7th, mark the date. Baizabad Community Center, we open the gate. At 4 in the afternoon, we address this heavy weight. Say this, this two was 2020. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Huh? Mm -hmm. They don't remember one month in 2020. The, first one. the second one was in March, you see? Yes, in March. Yeah. All right. Say when you're ready.
mandate to make a case for reparations for indigenous gen genocide and for the descendants of enslaved Africans as far as the CARICOM heads of government are concerned the case should examine crimes against humanity slavery the slave trade and racial apartheid now, why are we doing this as a civil society organization? It should be reminded that civil society continues to play an integral role, role in assisting in ensuring the rule of law and good governance, socioeconomic development, sustainable development in many societies, including Trinidad and Tobago. This evening, we are privileged to hear from Professor Emeritus Winston H. E. Sweet, who will be our feature lecturer, and who has been the feature lecturer in the previous four incarnations of this lecture series. I sh shall speak more intimately about Professor Sweet later on. But we are in Faisabad, the birthplace of the labor movement. And one would say that Yura but Bus Butler, who is not who's interred not too far away from where we meet this afternoon in Faisabad, his quest in the 1930s, alongside others like Adrian Kula Rienzi and others, was also related to reparations, even if that word was not used. But we are in Faisabad and we are very honored in Faisabad this afternoon to recognize one of Faisabad's most distinguished sons, one of Faisabad's most distinguished citizens, who has had a very illustrious career as a prosecutor in the courts of Trinidad and Tobago, as an appellate counsel at the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, and the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, where he himself had to prosecute war crimes and crimes against humanity under those legal statutes. He went on to become a judge of the Supreme Court of Trinidad and Tobago and was eventually elevated to the presidency of Trinidad and Tobago where he became the fifth 
president of Trinidad and Tobago. He is a progressive individual with a social conscience. He has had a, calypso, a career as a Calypsonian. He soon became being the prophet of Sisyphus. Let it not be said that uh, during his presidency, the, um, the office had to be demystified because he did, he did demystify the office by inviting students and others to enter the halls of the presidency. As a former diplomat, I could speak to that because when we had to present credentials in foreign lands, students were not available, but President Kamona, and you know who I'm talking about right now, did invite students to witness the presentation of credentials of foreign ambassadors accredited to Trinidad and Tobago. I'm going to invite an individual who I'm pleased to call my friend, Justice Anthony Thomas Aquinas Kamona, Senior Counsel, recipient of the Order of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, to begin the proceedings by giving a welcome. Justice Kamona. Good afternoon, everyone, and more importantly, good afternoon to all the persons who are online looking at this remarkable event, and remarkable because it is made even more exceptional by who would be doing the address today in the form of Professor Emeritus Winston Sweet. But my role is a simple one today. And I simply want to welcome Professor Sweet to the portals of Pfizer. I can tell you, I always feel a sense of great pride, and I boast about Pfizer being the seat of social revolution and social consciousness. Because from this small little town, much has taken place a telling effect in the context of the standard of living of those who live in Trinidad and Tobago throughout Trinidad and Tobago. Because sometimes we forget the role of the labor movement in terms of not only augmenting standards of, of living, but more importantly, creating an environment that demanded that workers be treated in a manner befitting the workers' dispensation, but more particularly as a human being. Because we in Faisabad, we lost so many of our families and neighbors during accidents in the oil fields. But we are here to celebrate something far more phenomenal in my view, something global. As president, I do recall on several occasions raising the issue of reparation and reparative justice because I felt there was a sense of slack in the system. As much as CARICOM had created that committee and Sir Hilary Beckles was doing a phenomenal job I felt in the individual islands, more so in Trinidad and Tobago, we were doing like what is often said in Barbados, we were just go long, go long, go long. And I always admired two persons in the Caribbean who, in my view, did human service for the reparation movement in the form of Sir Hilary Beckles as we all know, and of course, Professor Winston Sweet. Now, Professor is one not to blow his trumpet. And I feel in these circumstances, I need to blow the trumpet. Even if, in fact, I'm using a flute, but I need to blow his praise. Because Professor has, 
had the the mal effects as it has experienced the mal effects of institutional suppression we all know for example during the 1970s and this is why I say your presence here in Faisalabad is so important that you were in the vanguard of the movement for equality of treatment equality of opportunity and giving in fact the man on the street whether he was a black man or Indian man a sense of presence it was your way through the black power movement that you epitomized what in fact Shadow said when he said everybody is somebody and I always talk to you talk about about you Professor Sweet that you were placed on Nelson Island and there was a fight for you to take your final year engineering exams and by dint of effort you were allowed to take the examination down at Nelson Island he was a final year engineering student and when the results were announced Professor Winston Sweet got first class honors and to my mind that speaks volumes of the resilience the commitment the focus of this man that we are privileged to have here in Faisalabad because we all know here in Faisalabad about NUF the National Union of Freedom Fighters we were teenagers then and a lot of us know that a lot of the fighters of NUF came from Faisalabad and a lot of them died they were brutally gunned down in the forest forest reserve on the gallows and in some cases there was there are strong indications that those killings were extrajudicial killings but we are here today to celebrate something very telling in the hope that this would represent a vanguard movement because it would elucidate and articulate the concerns that we all should have about that abomination called slavery slavery destroyed culture it destroyed a way of life it destroyed families and today we still feel the effects of slavery not only in the context of social dysfunction but even in the context of the laws because many of us are not aware that many of the laws in the Caribbean region still that are still on the books came out of slavery and those laws should be removed from the from from the law books of Trinidad and Tobago and the Caribbean one of one of one of those particular laws that that we have in our books and we are looking with bated breath at what the Privy Council will say about it is the law of sedition but professor it is really indeed a great honor to have you here in Faisalabad you are an inspiration to all your students that you have that who are privileged to have been taught by you you are well known and respected throughout the Caribbean region and I can tell you in fact professor was one person when I was president I decided being a man of impeccable integrity that I would put him as a member of that whole procurement office I decided to put a man called Lal Chandanan who I felt was independent a critical thinker and one who would do right to all manner of persons and I said this was at first instant I needed to get someone who would chair the review committee of actions and decisions made by by Lai Chan and his members and there was no other person in my view who would fit the bill because I knew him to be a man of impeccable integrity a man who is independent 
who was objective and one who would do right to all. Because one thing, for example, I can tell you about Professor Sweet. He's, he is obsessed with the advancement of the common good. He is obsessed with the advancement of the common good. And I wish each of you here and all you listening, I wish that you appreciate what that says and what that means in the context of your responsibility as someone who is learned. And finally, I want to, I want to mention something that I wrote a few minutes ago. Because it has to do with the kind of support or lack of support for the reparation movement. I said ours is a neocolonialism that I sometimes think has duped us beyond repair. But the salvaging bomb are persons of the intellectual capacity, independence and integrity of Professor Sweet. There is, however, a burgeoning intellectual miasma when it comes to critical thinking in Trinidad and Tobago. Some of our cognizanti, intelligentsia, are defending wrong and calling it right in the face of the obvious. There appears to be a growing capitulation of varying degrees in the fourth estate, the press, that prefer to dine at the trough and feed in the banquet hall of honesty, straight talk, matter of factness, and the, under the unadulterated truth. And this is why I am here today. Because Professor Sweet is iconic. He represents an intellectual tour de force that is a diminishing breed. And a diminishing breed that we need. And this is why our young people listening you read the history and the biography of Professor Sweet and you will get a road map of what not only can be done but what must be done if we are to advance the state of the Caribbean, the state of Trinidad and Tobago and more particularly the Caribbean region. So I look forward as we all do to the lecture on reparation and we expect pearls of wisdom because we have heard it before and we're going to hear it again. So welcome with open arms. And I say this with, 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 with all my heart to the great, wonderful, mesmerizing, historical town of Isaiah. Thank you very much, Justice Anthony Thomas Aquinas Camuna, fifth and former president of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. I just want to add that I concur with everything that was said about Professor Sweet by President Camuna. But I also want to add that Professor Sweet, as an educator, worked assiduously to the training and the development of the science of engineering, first at the University of the West Indies, and more latterly at the University of Trinidad and Tobago. But his foray into education began long before that. He was a high school teacher, and he taught at the, the San Fernando, I think it's now called the Central, San Fernando Central Government, which was San Fernando Government Secondary, which was San Fernando, I believe, which was a modern secondary together with people like Roll Amy, who is with us this afternoon, and others. But his quest um, did not, for knowledge, went beyond engineering, for which he has received tremendous awards from the Association of Professional Engineers in Trinidad and Tobago, and from foreign chapters of engineering professionals. He has dedicated a number of time, a number of hours, days, years, 
to research the question of reparative justice. His voice has almost been one of a few in Trinidad and Tobago and the Caribbean who are steadfastly dedicated so much personal time and has mandated that his organization, Omurubi, adopt the issue of rep reparations for the descendants of enslaved Africans as its cardinal subject matter. I'm honored to be associated with Professor, Professor Sweet. I want to invite you both audience in person and those virtually online wherever you are in the globe to listen attentively as a chairman of the Universal Movement for the Reconstruction of Black Identity delivers the fifth in the lecture series on reparations. Professor Sweet. <laughs> Friends, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, comrades, this lecture today is in the form of accounting to the people on the present status of the struggles for reparation, for it has been a struggle. First, we will deal with our strategy in advancing the issue of reparation for the descendants of African enslavement. I may ramble from time to time because it is difficult to keep on track in such an important and overwhelming a topic. We must recognize the uniqueness not only of superior Faisalabad, but the entire oil belt, Erin, Carcass, Labre, Point Fortin, Palaseco, etc. This was the center of the Butler Labor Unit Union started as the Butler Labor Movement. It was the start of the anti-colonial struggle in the 1930s. It was the start of the anti-imperialist struggle that began before the outbreak of the Second World War, but continued with the outbreak of the Second World War with the incarceration of that national hero. And in a sense, he was the beginning of our independent struggle. I would like to pause and 
for a moment as I feel honored to be in this oil belt I was a young boy when all of this thing started but this region has produced I was tempted to say three but I might be wrong I was tempted to say that the region has produced three of the nation's national heroes Tubal Uriah Buzz Butler Krishna Devnarayan aka Adrian Kola Rienzi George Weeks and the gentleman who has done me great honor by coming here today our fifth president of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago I feel honored because I would say first the second lecture that we had in St. James when I started to talk and I looked up as I did do now I saw in the audience the Bishop of Trinidad and Tobago sitting not too far away from me with his brother and I said to myself that imposes a duty in me to elevate what I had to say even more where a bishop of the Anglican Church who was the parish priest in Princess Tongo in a, in a younger Edith time of my years who had grown to respect had paid me the respect to come to listen to me talk for an hour plus I said boy you are honored today then today I see in my midst Anthony Kamuna fifth president of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago not only coming to attend to our fifth lecture but to do me the honor of saying a few kind words I said a critic of the uh, I will try to stand for as long as I can I want to mention to you all before I start my substantive contribution that even this morning while I was talking to the, the, the reporter, the journalist, the, the air of negativity seeps through where people who believe that our struggle for reparation is a lost cause or a cause that has not yet started and I say to myself they cannot tell me what has not started it has started I say oh ye of little faith a step forward and a step backward some of you all might know that in fact in this week that has just been coming to an end the king of Holland Dutchland whatever you want to call it has agreed not only that Holland was guilty of the crime of the millennium and I repeat that that his country was guilty of perpetuating that crime and perpetuating that crime on African people but as he wanted now to publicly declare his guilt on, his, on behalf of his people and to promise that he will do everything in his ability 
to give reparation. So those of you who behaved, that is a lost cause, when one of the European monarchs agree to publicly say, which is what we keep asking, that reparation must begin with an admission of a guilt, of a crime of a millennium. He did that this week. And secondly, he agreed that he will use his office to give reparation to the descendants of the African people. He's not saying, well, that's a long ago, and people there, and we can't do nothing about that, and it's not me, it's my great great grandfather. He said, no, I am taking responsibility. I will make every effort of the Dutch monarchy and its funds to, to undertake reparation. Who am I? Who am I to say no? He is saying that not only will he give reparation, but he went so far to make me feel bad. He took up all this time to, in a gesture, a gesture of asking forgiveness. He went and laid a wreath at the grave site of a deceased African descendant of a slave. That's what the King of Holland did this week. So you want to tell me that the cause lost and it's too far behind and the, the Prime Minister is saying nothing? That is not stopping me. In fact, the more we talk, the more we talk, now is the time because King Charles of the British is about to make a public statement and we want to influence that public admission of guilt of the crime of the millennium two agreement to make reparation and to engage in discussion with the people who survive you have to sit with us and talk so that is where we are that is where we are some of you all might also know that earlier this year, the Anglican Church at its synod set up a committee to discuss the question of reparation while we here arguing over whether it finished or too late or not. All the, the Anglican Church bishops got together. They wrote up the first study they did was, was not substantial. I was very disappointed. Then they set up another committee that was much more substantive. And the bishops of the Anglican Cathedral decided that they too want to say we are guilty. The Anglican Church was involved in slavery, you know. They didn't only benefit from it, they were directly involved in it. And they decided to put aside $100 million for a start to make reparation. You, talking to, you think we're talking to ourselves? No, people listening. Some people listening. About three months ago, I am picking up my papers and I saw an article of a, a, a young academic with an East Indian name. She says she's from Trinidad. And she had just undertaken a study in the corporate sector businesses then that had engaged in slavery. She's from India. She's raising her voice on behalf of the Africans and pointing out that she is from Trinidad. And she carried out a study, a lengthy academic study, that ended up showing 
that the Guardian newspapers and the publishing company in the UK gained significant wealth on which it stands even today. And that she was exposing them. So much so that the board of directors of the Guardian in England agreed that they too will sit with the descendants and the Caribbean people and would begin to address the question of reparation having made a public statement. So I'm saying all of this is going on. Two weeks ago, in spite of what going reversals in America, the state of California, the largest state in America, has agreed to sit down and put on its papers, subject paper, the question of reparation to descendants of Africans. I was making a list because we in the Omobi have set up a committee to monitor all those who agree that they are guilty and those who haven't agreed that they are guilty that they will pay reparation and engage in discussion with the descendants of African people. We have set up a whole committee to monitor that because we still have people who say we're going nowhere. We waste time. So not only King George, King Charles are you waiting on. I mean, all those that say that they're not going to contribute. The president of France said that he understands that, he recognizes it, but that they're not giving any money to that. That's something going past. So he's one. We are keeping record of those who believe that reparation is a waste of time and those who keep. And we will keep struggling. Part of what I will deal with here today is to point out what we in Nairobi have been calling for over the last couple of years. So I say that I am honored to come to Faisabad and the oil belt because of your historical contribution God, to the struggle and the development of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And I pointed out that I am waiting to see one of these days we in Trinidad accept formally. And we have like what some countries have, a boulevard or the elevated. A boulevard of the honored in which the gentleman in our presence will be listed among our national heroes because of what he has done. As my colleague pointed out, this is the fifth lecture. The first one we had uh, on the promenade jointly with the Anglican Church. We did one with the Anglican Church on the San Fernando promenade. It was well attended. We taped it. It went global, if not international, um, or uh, the, next week. And um, what we have is the second one was done, a repeat of the first, where I spoke to you about Bishop Duggan. That was the second one that we mounted. And I remember it vividly because it was the day that the Prime Minister shut down the country and we could not do any more like public lectures. The third one, under the auspices of the Anglican Church, was in Princess Strong. The fourth one was done under the auspices of the Faculty of Law at the campus of St. Augustine. And we call upon the Faculty of Law at the St. Augustine campus to do much more. We call on the University of the West Indies 
and the University of Trinidad and Tobago to take up the issue of reparation. And that what we wanted to see, in other words, is that the law faculty, with the assistance of the St. Augustine campus, set up a unit or a center that will focus on the history, the legislation, in particular, of the reparation struggle in the Caribbean, and particularly in Trinidad and Tobago. We want the university to take responsibility to give the leadership. So that was the fourth lecture. The fifth lecture is the one that you all are being subjected to today. What we have done in Omudi is we are focused on public lectures, discussions with it through the media, or submissions on the various chat sites, and a number of separate guest lectures at myself and another colleague have been asked to do from time to time, which we'll continue to do. So, so far what we did is five lectures, or this is the fifth lecture, and we had, I would like to point out that a lot of my work has been spent on the research that has fed this exercise. And as a result, I have produced, to date, I have not published them as yet, I have produced seven papers on different aspects. The first paper is the substance of the first lecture. That is the case for reparation to the descendants of African enslaved in the Caribbean. That was the first publication, the subject of the first lecture. The second paper deal with reparation. You see the first reparation is about reparation from the British in the case of Trinidad and Tobago to some extent. Because the issue about reparation from the other countries that engaged in slavery in Trinidad, the Spanish force, they started enslavement as early as Columbus's first voyage and they continued to a lesser extent in Trinidad, but more so in Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, etc. The second paper deals with the question now of reparation from 1834 to 1962. You all will recognize what that period represents. A period of underdevelopment and plunder. In other words, it was the period following emancipation. So the first target for reparation is British, those who were the enslavers, the British, the French, the Spanish, etc. We tend to focus almost exclusively on the British. I do not know why. Possibly they stay there the longest. But that's another issue. That's another issue where we have to look at the other European powers and call them to terms. 
But what is interesting, and I will keep her mind this point, and you will see where I'm coming from. In other words, at the end of slavery, the slave was not given any compensation for the abuse, the genocide, all the other things while we call it a crime of the millennia, including the length of time. In fact, I have listed in this paper what I call the demands, both of the British, etc., that come directly out of the genocide and the abuse over the first period, the period of underdevelopment and plunder. So part of this document, and I have been prevailing upon my colleagues who have more skill in this area than I do, I have none, that we will attempt to leverage legally the godly president might be able to help us on that. He being one of the distinguished judges in the international land. Dealing with the question of reparation for that post period. You see what happens when the, 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 the British were leaving, when they gave uh, what they call um, emancipation, they never considered the African. He was not in the discussion. Reparation was given to the slavers, not those who suffered from slavery. Well, we want the day now for considering reparation for the African who suffered during slavery. And now we turn to the second period where we had, as it were, emancipation, and we now have that period of colonialism, 34 to 62. And I say in 62, what is so interesting? It appears as if the British, as they say long ago, they cut and run. They cut and run, they were too glad to go. And our people were possibly too blind, too stupid, or too eager to get rid of them, to get them out of our side, that they never argued for reparation at the time of separation. And when we had that separation in 1962, nowhere on the agenda was a discussion about reparation. And that was the last chance. We didn't get a serious reparation for slavery, and now we're going to miss the reparation that we could and should have raised the issue on the table. When they were cutting and running, we were glad to see them go, and we didn't press the case. We did not press the case for reparation in the post emancipation period when our ancestors had even more brutality right down to 1962 then we come so now you see where the local governments and all of them were their opposition or not in those discussions in England about separation did not put on the agenda reparation it should have been put and we missed that boat the third paper which I spent some time doing is called The Invasion and Rape of Africa, Aku Bulan or the Mother of Mankind. Aku Bulan, that was the name that Africans called themselves. The mother of mankind. That's another issue. I'll talk about it if I have time. There was no martial plan. In fact, the, the, the international banks continue to rape us up to today. And we have to put on the agenda the question of lending 
colonies that were ravaged by not only climate change efforts, but ravaged by slavery. And now we must pay, pay them interest rates. And no country in the world that has been paying interest rates to the international lending agencies and the World Bank have ever been able to clean off the world. They are worse than any so-called money lender that they talk about in the Bible. They are worse than that. And that is part of the discussion that must be brought on the table while we talk about climate change because we suffer more about climate change than anybody else. So the third one is focused on reparation for the mother country. Our struggle cannot be seen in isolation. So I spent a lot of time studying the rape of the mother country. And therefore, while I do not hold myself as an authority to speak on behalf of the motherland, I believe I have a right to put in a say because I was de denied linkage and being there. So the third paper dealt with the reparation for that period and for Africa. Paper four is an interesting one that some of you all were even more interested in. The period 1962 to 1976. It is the descendants of the African enslaved versus the government of Trinidad and Tobago for and on behalf of the descendants of African enslavement in the independent state of Trinidad and Tobago. In other words, 1962, we are independent, but we are still suffering the effects of enslavement. And that we are saying that our governments, our governments should have raised the question as some of us raised. Some of us pay a terrible price, some of us still paying the price about that period of the consequences of the absence of reparation as it trickled down generation after generation. In other words, the harm that was done to black people in this country from 1962 to 1976. In other words, all that went on in 1970 and after. And part of what I did here is I prepared demands and late charges. I see the page opens nicely. Disappointment is what I call it. The revolution of 1970 and the resistance of 1970 to 1976. That is what is the cover of the fourth paper. So some of it is aimed at aliens who cut and run, who we shall put down and made them discuss at two stages. And then there are our own internal governments who did not do what they should have done. And they missed the boat in some sense. They don't want to discuss it now. When asked you hear what the Prime Minister or anybody else is saying about reparation. In other words, they, they, they are ignorant of the issue. They don't want to talk about that. They will say, but sweet, what are you talking about? That to finish long, long ago. And when they say that, I will read for them what happened in California last week, what happened in England, and I will tell them it's, not, it's still going on. And other people are saying it's still going on while we can't even hear them. The Caribbean leaders can't say anything. I will, I will, I will talk a little bit after about that. Paper five. What I labeled here beyond the reparation. Because as we were laboring in doing the research, talking to people, listening to them, trying to deal with the questions and some uh, answer questions that came out of share 
lack of knowledge and we realize that we have to answer. So I spent one, one meeting only dealing with questions. We have to answer people's questions. They're not stupid. They don't have the answers. We have to give them the answers. We have to explain to them. We have to explain to them, for instance, that when we start to talk about reparation, we are not only talking about reparation for Africans. We can't only talk about reparation for Africans. We have to talk about the first reparation for the first peoples. That has to be put on the agenda. And then somebody asked me, what about the reparation for the Portuguese and the Chinese? I tell them, look, they came on contract. And some of them enjoyed the contract, some went back, some say, and some doing well. Some people say, well, what about the East Indians? I say, yes, the East Indians should be entitled reparation for the brutality that they, they underwent. Because they were, when they said, some people tell me, well, see, they, they had a contract. I say, yes, but they were not equal parties. When the Indians came to Trinidad, they were not equal parties, right? They too were being exploited and they were brutalized. They suffered in the San Fernando area of, of killing them. They too suffer and therefore their leaders should be looking at that question of the breach of contracts and the brutality that they suffered. It does not diminish the claim of the African for wanting reparation. It strengthens his argument. It broadens the scope. It shows that the brutality of the Europeans on the third world people was extensive. They didn't only pick out the first people or the Africans. They also visited their cruelty on the East Indians. And that too are issues that should have been raised after 1950. That should have been raised in 1962. I am talking not only on behalf of Africans. I am talking on behalf of all those who have been abused. That paper was the fifth paper. Then came the sixth paper. Some are larger than the others. The sixth paper. And this is a paper I felt very, very worried when I started to work on it. Very, very worried. And I said to myself, I know it will be a can of worms. Do you all know that the people of the Arabian Peninsula, Islam and the Muslims, were the first to enslave Africans long before the Portuguese in 1440. Long before the Columbus venture in, 19, in uh, 1492. The Muslims came and invaded Africa, North Africa. And they visited upon Africa and the African people the longest period of enslavement from 640 of the current era. And some records carry it as late as 1960 in some countries. Nobody talks of it. It's a delicate topic. I spent a lot of time on it, agonizing. Agonizing on it. Paper number six, that is, paper number seven. You see, as I sit home, semi, <laughs> semi paralyzed, slowly dying, but not wanting to give up. The question of human rights is now affecting us in the country. Human rights. Again, my good friend and scholar, the judge might be able to help us. My contention is that the brutality and what continues in today 
against black people, the descendants of the Africans, is an abuse in the most extreme form. The question of continued brutality and the abuse of human rights, reparation represents the denial of human rights. So the se seventh paper deals with human rights. Human rights. And how do we see reparation as the logical conclusion of the abuse of human rights over hundreds of years from 1492 by the Europeans? And what has happened? The abuse of human rights has morphed. It has changed from being abject slavery to colonialism to imperialism. It has continued in different forms. For instance, the Africans were never given land. A fundamental question of land to the landless. And I'm going to remind you that all attempts by European colonialism to discharge of their duty to the total people, including their abandonment of all sense of human rights in dealing with South Africa. In other words, in the case of South Africa, South Africa is an unfinished revolution. As goodly as Nelson Mandela may have sought to be. Prison does that to you. The, the people of South Africa had their lands taken away from them. And they were never given back their land up to today. And what lessons we have learned from that, and we can extrapolate it to here in the Caribbean, is that people who do not have land are powerless. They are powerless. And therefore, the denial of human rights must include giving back people their land. And just like how that applies to the South Africans up to now under apartheid in South Africa continues to affect the Africans in the Caribbean. And I'm talking, my mind is going back to something else I wanted to tell you about. A few days ago, about three, four days ago, I listened to the BBC. And there was a, a young woman who had just been made, I think, a minister in, in, in um, Brazil. You all know that Brazil has the largest concentration of African people outside of Africa. A hundred and ten million Africans live in Brazil and they are under apartheid just like South Africa. I sat down there, I could I almost start to cry. Because this woman, she looks like about early late twenties, early thirties, and um, she was made a minister, given responsibility to deal with human rights and this sort of thing. And the Englishman who was interviewing her from, from, from BBC was making more clear of her. And she was just was not taking him on as they say. And um, the problem is her sister was an activist politician. And the, the right wing terrorist of the what the father name again? I don't want to call his name. He has fled Bolsonaro. His terrorist gang executed the woman who I was listening to, her sister, as a politician. And that is what moved this younger, younger sister to get involved. And she started to talk. She started to talk about reparation. And the fool from the English BBC was telling her about, you know, these things can't work. 
you, you, you can't solve all these problems in one time. You expect to solve all these things one time? And she said, we have been at it for a long time. Brazil, one of the early countries in the Americas where slavery started. And it was one of the countries in America where slavery continued the longest bar Cuba. Brazil remained a slave colony as late as 1888, long after the British agreed to let us go. That don't mean that they were better treated because they were longer in slavery. Because she points out that genocide is still going on in Brazil. And I said, if I had said that, boy, you would say you're exaggerating. This is a Brazilian young woman, a politician. Lula has just appointed her. And the British one making mockery of her. And tell her if she expects to achieve what she expects to get on. All kinds of ridicule and they do this. And she was pointing out that genocide is still going on. The kind of genocide that we see on the media going on in America. Where policemen kill black young men just walking in the road through them. I thought that that was America I was listening to. She said, Brazil, that is what is still going on. And I said to myself, we are talking about reparation. One of the things we have to recognize is that we have a very loose and poor relationship with what I call the Afro-Latino, the Latin African. And we have to become more informed and aware of what is going on in Latin America and the extent to which some African brothers and sisters in the Americas continue to suffer equally if not as worse. So, as I said, as I was looking at the BBC, I thought of that and I said to myself, hell, those are the, the um, what I want to do, as I said, I'm, I'm going to, um, I'm going to bring out a few things. What I want to talk briefly about with you is a little bit about what I call the case stated. Because I have, in fact, been documenting, documenting what I call the demands at the different stage. I have, I have put down what the, because people say, what all you want? I have put down the demands by those who asked for reparation of each group who has oppressed them. Each period that we are claiming reparation, we have identified the nature of the reparation that we seek. The period it covers and the form it must take. And we have gone through this from the very early ones to the latest. So, what I've also brought here for some of you all to see is some books. Books that I consider are essential as we mobilize, as we become aware and we pass on information to other people, our younger people who don't know anything about what is reparation or the media who asks us questions. And I have here one of our great heroes, Marcus Garvey. Marcus Garvey is important in our, in our as it were, our list of national heroes. He's not a Trinidadian, but he's a national hero of Trinidad. A certain time, the largest number of Garveyite branches outside of Jamaica and the United States was in Trinidad. Garvey was, in fact, a national hero 
of Trinidad and the West Indies. He was one of the first people in the modern era, I say in the modern era, to call for reparation in the form of repatriation. People confuse the two words. He said there are people in the Americas and the Caribbean, the Jamaican, who want to go back to Africa. They want transport and they want assistance to settle back in Africa. And out of that was the Back to Africa movement. That is not the first one, there were several. One of the earliest ones was what set up Sierra Leone and the other great returning African set up by a, a wealthy black American. In other words, Garvey was the first, one of the first who talked about going back home. And he went so far as to raise money and bought a ship. He got all smarted by a lot of things. Bought a ship to take people physically who wanted to go back to Africa. And what amuses me, when I started to do some of this research some couple of years ago, I learned that there was a movement up in Belmont, and I actually met some of the survivors, who upon emancipation, they told the British, we want to go back home to Africa. Take us as far as, far as England, and we will get a ship to get back to Africa. So you had some Africans who in their reparation, you know, it was the repairing of the situation. They wanted to separate themselves from this place. And they went to, to Africa. Ethiopia was one of the things. The, 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 the Rastafarian movement was a very strong one in that. So I am saying Gavi is a very important part of that whole. Another myth that, that, that we have to deal with is those who try to give us the impression that the slave was very passive, that he didn't fight as much as he should. And to this, I will show you all. There are two books I have here. One is called The Defeat of the British by the Jamaican Maroons. This is Jamaica. In fact, the Jamaican Maroons, that is slaves, defeated the British Army in Jamaica. And the British had to sign a treaty to leave them alone in a section. Any one of you all have gone, gone to Jamaica, you hear about the cockpit country. This was what they did. They defeated the British in a battle and the British had to leave them alone. So of course not many people write about it and they don't talk much about it. This book is another interesting one. This is written by a fellow called Alvin O. Thompson. You all will remember him. He used to be on campus in our time. He had a son that some of you all might know, Obadiah A. Thompson. One of the top 100 meter sprinters at the time, one and two. This is Obadele Father's scholarship. He, he was from Ghana. And Obadele mother is a Belgian, so he grew up as a Belgian athlete. But the, the, the issue is this is a study of Maroons in Central America, in the Americas. He did his PhD on this. This is Obadele Father. And it will disabuse your minds that the slaves passively accepted their slavery. Far is from the truth. And this is what this diagram tells us about the about the, 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 the resistance. So some some Africans say, all right, give us a ticket and let us go back home. Others, like those some in America, say we have done too much to build this country to give you all it. I will not allow you to benefit from my labor. 
this country, Trinidad, the Caribbean, Brazil, United States, all these places, we have built it right now that fellow in, in, what's it, Florida, is talking about work and all kind of nonsense. Africans built Florida as they built a lot of America. And they have a right to want part of it. They have a right to want part of it. And that is the grounds that they are now fighting for. The right, not of the favor, the right to gain what they invested in. They built America. Technologically, the infrastructure, the whole system. And they say they want a part of it. Now, there are a couple of other. There's one other book here about it. I saw that. This was Adrian Cola Rienzi. This is interesting. You know what is interesting about this? Several things. One man who started, helped to start two different trade unions. One man who's helped to start two trade unions. An Indian. Who devoted his life to setting up the OWTU and the Canadian Farmers Association. One man. One man who didn't ask, what is for me? But who spent his time, and he is a national hero. That is when we talk about national heroes, he is a national hero. As is what the sorting of this issue without talking about CLR James. CLR James, a Trinidadian coming out of the Tonapuna and Princess Song area, is not only responsible for this book, Beyond a Boundary, which many people think is about cricket. But if there ever was a metaphor, this was a metaphor. He is talking about cricket, but he's talking about racism. He's talking about racism, and he's talking about cricket. And the refusal to give black West Indians leadership in cricket in the West Indies, when they had more than owned it. When cricket in the West Indies had to be led by a white man. No matter whether he could not make the runs, he had to be in charge. The white man, whether he came from Barbados, Trinidad, or Jamaica, had to be the captain. And therefore, CLR saw one of the big struggles that had to be overcome for the black man was for him to be respected in his own land for his competence. It is crowded in a metaphor. And some people say he was struggling to make Frankie Warrelly captain. That is, that is at one level. Because Frankie Warrell, the Bajan, was in fact one of the outstanding cricketers of the age, of the moon. I had the honor to be in the hall where he was the old chairman. And um, CLR took that story of winning the fight to make Frankie Warrell the captain of the West Indies cricket team when it was taught that white people had to be the captain of everything, including the captain of Texaco, the captain in the public service, the captain in everything. They had to be white. So when CLR wrote his book, he was a prophet writing in a language that we Trinidadians and West Indians love to talk in parables treat with it. 
This is another book. This is a book. I believe that. You have a copy of this one, boy? You have to get a book for the, for the young one. We must make sure our young children have a copy of this book. Black Jack Owens. That's another book that is very important in the struggle for reparation. Black Jacobins. Black. And Jacobins was a type of group of people. And the question here you notice that in some of these books they have a nice cover with the fancy tree up creepy cut. And, and what CLR is talking about here is about the first slave rebellion that was successful in the world in the history of mankind. Before Spartacus where a slave emancipated a country in fact i was looking in the on my on my cell phone checking out um when did the dominican republic get emancipation you know the dominican republic would say they have only 10 percent black and the rest is more at all right they say they still have their emancipation date as the same date as Haiti, you know, because to say Louverture emancipated the whole island, and regardless of what went on after, the, San, the Dominican Republic still recognized to say Louverture, the black man, as having emancipated the whole island. It is a, it is a ex, uh, exercise for all of us who want to look for something to be proud of. The history of one of those, he would have been an African who came here either as a little boy or his parents came, but he was one of the unfettered. In other words, he didn't have a long period of gestation in the, in the, in the slave environment. And therefore his passion his passion to be liberated never win. And that is what is important about this book. The passion, the passion that two cellular was able. And that is why another day we'll talk about that, about the extent of the brutality that the Americans have wrought against Haiti up to the present. Because Haiti represents an example that they wanted to, to cancel, to wipe off the face of the earth. Because that is the first successful slave rebellion in the world, the history of Homo sapiens. Black people had, have done that. It's one of many things that we are divorcing. For those who say that we never fought, or that he went to know military college, you know. He taught himself. He taught himself. And I, I wanted to share that with you all. There are two other things. I always tell my friends and those who ask me foolish questions sometimes. You see this book? This is a more modern attempt by what a contemporary of, of ours. Rodney wrote this book as a young man, Walter Rodney, a Guyanese national hero. How Europe underdeveloped Africa. And one of the papers that I did when I looked at how Europe continues 
to underdeveloped Africa. Up to today, I found myself having to go back and look at what Walter saw as a young man going to Africa. In other words, the exercise by the Europeans to brutalize and enslave the Africans both at home in Africa and here in the New World is a systematic study and is another document I would commend to you that you should read. This is a book written by a colleague of mine. He was in Uri. I remember that day in the, in the, um, in the Savannah when I raised the point that there could be no emancipation, no reparation without land distribution and South Africa has demonstrated this. A lot of other countries have demonstrated this. Until you engage in land distribution, there's no independence. All what we talk about is joke because there has never been distribution of land to the landless in Trinidad. There has not been distribution of land any further in the Caribbean, except in Haiti. My friend wrote this book, a PhD study, Claudius Pigas. He looked at the question of violent resistance, the revolutionary emancipation, the whole question of slaves taking it upon themselves to lead themselves out of bondage, to lead the fight. And I'm saying that too is another very interesting. But I hope that some of you all might find strange that I have brought here with me. This is a book entitled Capitalism and Slavery, written by Eric Williams. I don't know what he thought of it as he grew older. Because on the outside of the cover, there's a picture, a drawing of slaves with sticks around their necks, including little children. The genocide. The genocide that took place, that was slavery. For those of us who sometimes forget how brutal it was, this is the genocide in, before the Middle Passage. This is the genocide bringing them from Africa to the coast. And somebody put this, or William put this, on the cover of his book. That is slavery, as brutal as it was. As brutal as it was. Some people ask me, why do I say that reparation is necessary? Why am I talking about the crime of the millennium? I say it's a crime because of several things. One, the duration. The enslavement of the African began with the European part in 1440 of the, with the, with the um, Portuguese, and then it continued under Columbus, 1492, and that went on and on, almost on tempted to see up to the present. The enslavement, long, check the years, it did not stop while it ended officially uh, in the British areas in 1834 and they tried to carry it on for 10 more years and the slaves say no and they ended up taking 4 more years of apprenticeship as another joke. 
The question of reparation was to go on, as I said, in Cuba up until 1895. Brazil, 1888. Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, 1872, they're about. And even when we had emancipation, slaves were not given land. In fact, there's a whole, they went in look at the law. A lot of things emerged in the law. For instance, loitering. Loitering is a post-emancipation crime. Africans not working. What you walking in the road there for? What you walking there for? So you had loitering. You have assembling. You are making long noises, you know, singing your religion, beating your drum. And that Africans, even when they worked hard and saved up their money, there was every attempt put up to prevent them from buying land. So there was a conspiracy against the African. And therefore the, the African continued to be pauperized, brutalized, and genocide. So, the question of what I said I had done, and I won't burden you with it today, is that for each one of the stages of reparation, I have written out what are the demands that I believe that we should be seeking adjudication on, evaluation on compensation for it. In other words, whether it be the Spain who we forgot and we tend to focus only on the British, are we going to let the French go free? Look, the Dutch said they will give, how much they will give? What about the the, 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 um, the Swedes? In other words, I have attempted to categorize what is the claim in each case, what are the claims, the claim elements, and what I want. And I did this for each stage of the reparation struggle, whether it be to an external body or even the local government, our own governments here. And my, my arm, um, I will let you in with a little um, confession. One of the things that I am glad that um, I have recovered, I was not too well a few, a few weeks ago, I decided that I have, to, I have to take that a little further. That is, I want help to prepare the legal format of these things. And we have to take what we call the legalizing of the claim. We have to take it beyond agitation and grumbling to moving it through the United Nations agencies and through the international courts and even the local and regional courts. I, I, I call the, the Caribbean Court of Justice to tell me, well, you know, we can't do that. And that's all right. Time. But what I'm saying is, the claims have been settled. I want assistance in taking these claims to the next stage. I need legal help to prepare the claims for the United Nations fora, wherever there is an opportunity to take these claims in the UN system or the international court system. Some people tell me, boy, you know, the international court it wasn't created to deal with that. And then I remember, uh, 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 I always say a friend of mine, a uh, uh, well, colleague of mine, Ian R. Robinson, when we, were, when we were in the streets together, and um, we felt that we wanted to push him more to deal with the, the, the question of the local politics. Um, we suspended for a moment 
struggle on the African issue, and we told local, local politics to get that moving. And he felt that that was not the priority. And he focused almost exclusively on the question of the International Criminal Court. And his name has gone on in history, that uh, he has gotten that settled. He's recognized internationally for, for pioneering that. And, and thing. But, but we end up still with the problem that we have to make the legal system domestic and international and UN entertain the just cause of the people. So I am saying each one of these stages that have been captured in all these papers that have been writing here, we have to legalize the struggle. That is where we are now at this point. We have to take the struggle to the next stage of legalizing and not only agitation. And we have, in other words, to keep the government busy. There's one other thing I want to do before I close. Um, you all are aware that CARICOM in 1913, how oh no, I say, 2013, set about developing a 10 point plan. And this 10 point plan should guide the the, 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 the struggle for reparation in the Caribbean. But I will make one or two comments. For instance, this body and the 10-point plan, I ask, when last did you, have you heard our Prime Minister make a statement on what is the status or what is Trinidad's position on any issue pertaining to reparation? When last have you had a reporting from the Prime Minister, a comment trying to get King Charles to do or say something? King Charles is going to be forced to make us something, but not because of us. The Jamaicans have taken it up. And King Charles, in the next few weeks, the just given the second crown, is going to have to deal with those questions. Reparation. Reparation for the descendants of Africans in Syria. And we can't claim to be in the vanguard or the forefront of that. Because we are not. CARICOM has issued this template plan and I'm suggesting to you that every one of you all should get a copy. I printed the third one last night. You could get this document and ask yourself, are you aware of what the 10 point plan came to you? And what the, 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 the 10 point plan calls upon your government to do? Your government is supposed to set up a local committee. The local committee is supposed to monitor and take the fight forward, reparation. The local organization is silent. I'm not going to worry about them. I'm going to keep doing what I believe is my task. So the question of reparation and the 10 point plan is what you must demand of the politicians. I'm not my politicians said both the opposition party and the governing party. I've never heard the opposition party make a statement on the CARICOM 10 point plan. We have to have a plan, but I have gone further. I believe that the CARICOM must take the fight forward. CARICOM members have now become in charge of the Commonwealth of Nations, what used to be the Commonwealth. Some people are saying, look, let not die, that's a colonial thing. I say no. That's a forum that brings together India and a number of other countries. It's a ready-made forum for you. Use it. Don't let it die. Take it over. Don't let the King Charles be in charge. If he want to be a member, let him be a member, but not in charge. And we have to make that character leader nations take up the issue of reparation for the Caribbean people. 
So I am not only talking about what our governments must do, I am talking about CARICOM must do more. And how CARICOM must take up the struggle on the international arena. So, ladies and gentlemen, I have kept you here a long time. And um, I will continue my journey of working. And um, I am I am working. We have been working with the with the Anglican Church, and we are waiting for them to invite us to to do more lectures to inform the public as to what is reparation for the country. We will keep doing that. In fact, recently I even tried to to get involved with somebody who is on one of these committees with the bishops in England and, uh, to see if we could get to penetrate as high up in that organization to lead you forward. So thank you very much, brothers and sisters, comrades. Thank you for being here. And thank you for being such a good audience. Thank you very much, um, Professor Winston H. E. Sweet, Professor Emeritus of UE, and Professor at UTT. I think we must not forget one thing. Professor Sweet has had some health challenges, including two surgeries on his heart. And to stand here and to deliver such a lengthy lecture, I think it deserves a tremendous one of applause. I thought I was a hard worker, I mean, but his productivity and the, the, the prolific nature of his, of his writings is something else. So what have we, we started, we ended where we started. Is there a case for reparations? In seeking to make the case, he provided anecdotes, he provided evidence because, and Judge Kamoya would agree, in order to make a case cogent, there has to be evidence. He preferred possible solutions as to how do you prosecute the case? Is it at the United Nations? Is it at any international criminal court? Which may not have been fashioned, which may not have been created for a specific purpose, retrospective application of the Rome Statute. We have a former judge of the Women's Statute here, President Kamona. I forget to mention that was one of his many hats. But what are we to do? Um, Professor Sweet's organization did not conjure from the sky this discussion. He's situated in the context of the CARICOM Heads of Government 2013 decision mandating that CARICOM states address the issue of rep reparations through the establishment of national committees, notwithstanding the, that the CARICOM itself established a reparations commission headed by Sir Hilary Beckles. But he addressed reparations throughout the ages, the different stages, and, and juxtaposed it with not only from the Caribbean perspective, but South African perspective, the Latin American perspective, which we tend to forget they were slaves in Latin America, and the Caribbean. It's not the only Anglophone issue. So I believe a lot has been said. A lot needs to be done. So we have an opportunity now to pose any questions to Professor Sweet. Uh, those online, you could put it in the chat feature on the YouTube channel, the Amubi YouTube, YouTube channel. And the audience here there's a microphone, and we have a few minutes uh, uh, for questions. We want to manage Professor Sweet very um, closely because we want him to be around for a long time to come. So the opportunity is here for those 
online and in person to pose questions. Any questions, any comments, we are willing to get it. I recognize a member from the audience. There is a, a microphone that you could use that is on the floor. And you, you'd give a name, please. Any question? Kenneth Charles is my name. I am originally from Faisabad. I born just behind Hilo. Since 1958, I've had a lot of experience in terms of the oil fields. I understood the situation that the Africans would have had with, um, with the, um, the whites who was running the oil fields, as you would have mentioned earlier on. I'm familiar with you from since going to school, but in your literature, you used to write literature for Euro. United Revolutionary Organization. Since I go to school, I've been reading um, on um, reading your literature. All right? Enough for me. Now, the question of reparation. I have a friend who lives in Boston, and he would have called me, and we had a discussion, and his belief is reparation is supposed to be you give everybody a million dollars, and that is the end of it. I beg to differ. I told him I was not of that view. Now, reparation is what you're doing for the people who had suffered slavery, the experience of slavery, not just working on the plantation, but from the origin where they would have raped the Africans from their homeland and brought them to the Western world. They would have also enslaved Africans on their own land. So that when slavery came about, the African free life of development had stopped. The Western world would have gone ahead in terms of development, in terms of education. They would not have been passing on any education to us. So that we would have been on par, equal with them in terms of contributing to humanity so that paying for slavery all right, by giving just money does not satisfy reparations as far as I'm concerned because under development according to, to Walter Rodney all right, was one of the main effects right, of slavery, hence the reason why you have so much backwardness in Africa, even in the Caribbean, look at what's happening to, to, to Haiti. Okay? So, are we looking at reparation just only in terms of funds, or are we looking at the development of the African people, knowing what they would have passed through, right, and remove all hindrances so that they can advance and become on par with the rest of the educated world. Okay? Now, I am, I am one of what you call the Americans. Right? 1817, um, Fian Bashana Jackson would have come here and they went into the companies. Okay? So, slavery for um, Fian Bashana would have ended when they came here. I don't know what type of work they would have had when they started here. I know they would have been on, um, building the road to Mayaro and all that. Right? So that does, is there any benefits for me in terms of funds, finances, right? In, um, because they were slaves in America and not in Trinidad. Okay? So that is an issue that puzzles me. I, I wish you can give me some clarity on that. One more thing. <clears throat> Presently in the world, there is the Ukraine scenario. 
and we all experiencing well we all learning what is happening to the to the, to the grain the grain produced by Russia and Ukraine okay but they are not selling much grain to only two percent of the grain they send it to Africa and Africa demands more I would I want to express my view that that in itself shows that slavery is not has not ended it continues as long as the system that grew out of slavery that is that, that protects all the uh, all the rich people all the monopolies I want to be short on it all right they are not considering us in any way today because Borel who is the the uh, foreign policy person for for the European Union he called Europe the garden and he called the rest of the world the jungle okay so that the extent to which they are going today because Biden the president of the United States of America would have said that right now their struggle is for the survival of capitalism I am of the view that as long as capitalism exists all right reparations will be a serious problem for all African people to get okay so that is my all right thank you very much and I just want to remind the audience um, to keep the questions as tight as possible two questions I, I gather one is question of does reparation take a financial form or um, the, the, the question asks like me he's a descendant of Americans as well and whether that applies professor sweet you could answer the question from your seat or you would come here right let, let, let me apologize for this I'm, I'm growing increasingly deaf that's one of the price prices that you have to pay for being staying around too long so I might have missed some of what, what you are country let me, let me start off by saying that my one side of my relatives were in Princess Town as far as I have traced in the Anglican Church earliest record that it goes back to 1840 in a document where somebody records that the Swedes were one of the earliest people who are, I suppose, converted to, to the Anglicanism. So I assume my, my great great grandfather was either, because 1840 is just after 1834, 38. So I woke out that my great grandfather, great grandfather would have been either a recently emancipated slave or he, who knows he might have come from St. Lucia as a as a, a free, free, free slave free man because there was some of them that came from St. Lucia etc or so he could have been a slave a recently emancipated slave or he could have been an American because the Americans came here as a result of a a battle that the British lost. And the British say that all those slaves who joined with them to fight the so-called resurgence, the, the Americans, and after, when the British lost, they agreed to carry all the ex-slaves who were on their side and their family to come to the Caribbean. They start off in Bahamas or some of them, and then they bring them down, they end up in, in, in fifth company. So that would have happened somewhere between 1815 and 1819. Good, so I have been trying to trace my family tree through a number of the routes. In fact, I just sent one a few days ago for my sister and sister to type it up. But I cannot locate where my great great grandfather came from. I go back down to to, to 1840s 
Now, what is interesting about that is that when you leave Manambu Road by the junction by the, the, the Presbyterian Church, yeah, there, there some people who call that sweet corner. Because I think that same fellow who I can't trace his origin became the sextant in the Anglican Church. And as a result, he purchased a piece of land on that corner that stretches from the shop going back around almost to the Anglican Church. And a lot of my relatives lived there. None of my brothers and sisters lived there. No, all the cousins and occupied that thing. So I know that there's some cloud as to whether we were Americans or we were slaves newly emancipated. Now, so in terms of whether there should be reparation for them, in one of the early papers that I did, I, I dealt with that. I believe that the slaves or the, the emancipated slaves would not have chosen to come here. And they too should have been entitled to reparation. Although the, the British did give them a piece of land, allocated land in that area and told them, look, be good boys, stay in, stay in and this cauldron, right? Because outside this culture, we carry on our slavery still, right? We carry on slavery, and they had planned to carry on slavery for quite some time. They were forced to stop it in 1834. So from 1815 to 1834, you had slavery in Princess Town, and you had emancipated people in Princess Town. You had people of your descendants, the Americans, free and told they told to stay in that corner and don't interfere with these fellas, they are the slaves. I believe that issue has to be dealt with. And our politicians, although the earlier political parties did mobilize and they were forced to at least go up in fifth company six and, 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 and get a number of the the the, 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 the Americans involved in the politics. In fact one of the first Americans to get involved in the serious in the politics is is um what's his name again? Um no 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 this is this is this is Patrick Manning's wife father okay. Huggins when I got involved in that movement because they used to invite me to come and talk to them I, I wrote one of the early books he was one of the early people who, who, as it were, took pen to paper and tried to document some of the things about the, the nature of the Americans living up in that area up there. So I believe that that might have been the start and should, for quite some time, they didn't sell out the land. But after time, they started to sell out the land. And then we end up with all kinds of other people who were not even Africans end up in, in, in the fifth company, the only land. That was not supposed to be, but be honest with me. Um, that is part of the first question you have to whether, whether, whether you are entitled to, 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 to reparation. That was part of it? That was part of your issue? Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so my point is that the issue is very, it needs to study. And, um, Patrick's father in law did the first text written up and write up on that. Boys Yogans, right? I have three copies of the book home, in fact. Um, so I think that um, more serious study. In fact, I did a, a, a presentation where I pointed out all the groups. People asked me about the Chinese, they asked me about the Portuguese, they asked me about the, 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 the French cruel, they asked me about the Indians. And I, I tried my best to, to, to deal with how I feel. All of these, the only people that I didn't take a big, a big, made a big step on was the indigenous people. Because when I tried to talk to them, I realized that they were way ahead of us in dealing with reparation. The so-called um, Arima people, right? In other words, they were they were way ahead of the, of the Africans or even the Indians looking to the Costa Reparation. 
and um, they told me they were organizing something, so I say I am willing to, to join with you all. Well, I can't speak for you all because you all are more developed in this struggle for anybody. The same thing applied to the, the Americans. When I got closer to them, I realized that they had, had been much more informed about the issue, about their own history, than the rest of us in, the rest in, in, in that area. There are some other questions to you. Is that, that, um, huh? This way. This online we need to address online. Uh, yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Professor Sweet. And we have some questions and comments online here as well. And speaking about Americans, I must say publicly that I'm proud to be a descendant of Americans. My aunt, Rita Smike, she's the, the, the matriarch of the Americans. She'll be celebrating her 110th birthday in December from Princess Tongue. So, so from American stock as well. But regarding the, uh, to the first question, there's a Sandra Gift online who has reminded us what the 10 point CARICOM action plan sets out. It's a range of desired actions to be covered on the reparation. And they include economic, educational, psychological, and developmental measures public health, building of cultural institutions, technology transfer, and debt cancellation. So it's not only matters of a pecuniary nature. The 10-point plan is a range, a host of activities. And I must submit, in terms of our trade relations, I said that in a forum in Jamaica, we, could tr we should try to include in any economic partnership agreement that we are dealing with, with the Europeans, which has replaced um, the old um, uh, trade arrangement under Lume, we, we could try and situate the issue of reparations there. But that's a comment, and thank you, Ms. Gift, online for that. There is, uh, I think, R.H. Redock, I don't know if it's the famous Professor Redock, but the question is can we lobby for the teaching of Trinidad and Tobago history in schools, which also links to the issue of reparations? Professor Sweet. Well, I am glad that both of these questions are, are being raised. Let me start with the second one. If we do not seek to study our history, nobody else will do it for us. This is why I come to all these meetings and I bring a different set of books to encourage the audience and those listening to realize that if we don't get our history done, learn about it, then not only will it be forgotten, but that we can't let our history and our problem and reparation from our standpoint to be taken up by somebody else. They're not going to. Now, we're going back to the question, it's an eternal question that people ask. Reparation. And I always answer quickly. I don't want no $2,000 or $5,000 for Winston Street. That is not my idea. I think the problem is bigger than that. Take, for instance, my colleague in Jamaica, the, the, the Chancellor of the University. Um, he is one of those persons who has raised the point about the health. Just last night I was talking to somebody about that. We in Jamaica and Trinidad are the centers in the world for amputees. We are, you know, people ask, but how come? Because we suffer from diabetes so much. A heritage of slavery and the slave diet that we end up, in other words, with the most amount of amputees. But there's something else, as I was telling somebody. Do you know where we get our amputee, our limbs from? India. And one of the issues that we should be looking for is possibly setting up a factory to make these limbs for people who have lost their limbs. We could do it here. Possibly the, 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 the British people, as part of the reparation deal, should try and set up something here. Both in terms of the assistance in our Caribbean hospitals to deal with diabetes and education about that, and also to deal with those who suffer from diabetes. Diabetes also, we have a high number of blindness. And therefore, that's another thing that we suffer from. And part of what our, our reparation should include, 
and demand from the Europeans who, who put us in the sport is assistance in dealing with possibly free glasses, medical checkup for your eyes, all these things. When they cut and run, they didn't do that. It's not too late. We should call on King Charles to set about dealing with that because there's a problem in Jamaica and in Trinidad. So I'm saying there are a lot of issues that we have to do that. You know, I went to England a few years ago and somebody took me to a, to a museum. The museum was Tate and Lyle Museum. You know who Tate and Lyle is? Tate and Lyle was the owner at a certain time of the largest sugar factory in the Commonwealth when they bought the Jamaican sugar factory. They became the largest. Before that, they were in Trinidad, and they were a fairly large one. And therefore, I am saying, this person took me one day, luncheon, after we had eaten in a, in a, in a restaurant, took me to a museum next door, the Tate and Lyle Museum. And I said, imagine Tate and Lyle was operating in the Caribbean and they haven't built any museum for us. There's nothing here, not only Tate and Lyle, a lot of these other companies have left the Caribbean. No hospitals, no special centers for science and technology, right? Neither in Africa. Neither in Africa. And the same thing in other words. We have, we are saying that not only medical attention for amputees and glasses and helping in the, in the hospitals, but these are, so I am not saying give me 2,000 or 5,000 like. No, I am saying that when you cut and run, you left our roads, our bridges in a state. When you cut and run, you left our schools in a state. Look at your, your schools. Look at your bridges and your thing. You don't think that you should have fixed up the bridges and the schools. I spoke to one of the bishops. I tell him, how come you, because you should ask them now, to fix the church schools and the, and the, and the um, what do you call it, the, the cathedral had fallen down. That not only the bishop, the, 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 the government must pay, but the, the church of England mm. must help rebuilding school stocks as part of the reparation. So not for me or my children. They should come back and do something for the Caribbean people and the abandoned and the cotton on Thank you very much, Professor Sweet. And regarding the issue of diabetes and hypertension, I must remind the audience that when I was at the United Nations, CARICOM piloted a resolution on non-communicable diseases. And member states of the United Nations have required to implement that resolution. So going back to Ms. Ms. Gift's um, reminder to us that the 10-point plan also includes questions of public health. Perhaps that is something we could address as well in the context of reparations uh, with regard to getting assistance to, um, to, to aid in our fight against non-communicable diseases, which include diabetes and hypertension. But we do not want to overwork Professor Sweet because we are mindful that you... Yes, Professor Sweet wants to make a point. The Fifth Industrial Revolution and the British government have just decided that they are going to stage an international conference to discuss artificial intelligence. You don't think they should, that we in the Caribbean need to know something about artificial intelligence? You don't think the British should see that they owe us a duty to set up that infrastructure that we could deal come out of the, the second and third industrial revolution playing with, 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 with the machinery that belonged to a hundred years ago and get us into the 21st century. What about our schools? Why aren't they helping our schools, secondary and primary, to deal with the, the change in science and technology? This, you know, I am saying there's a lot, not only easing up on the, 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 the borrowing of the, the lending rates, but technology can show. 
And I'm not talking about dumping technology here and looking to milk some money. Huh? I'm talking about assistance of Japan. And that applies in my paper where I dealt with what they did to Africa. That that is what Europe should be doing in Africa instead of what they're doing right now is continuing to fleece Africa of the mineral wealth. The energy of a 25 year old is amazing. It's amazing. But I, I'm happy that Professor Sweet mentioned technology transfer because even with international treaties, which are legally binding obligations, mm -hmm. there is almost a breach. No, there is a breach. The, the implementation is in the breach where states parties to treaties and conventions that are required to transfer technology to developing countries have not been doing that. So thank you for reminding us, Professor Sweet, that that is consistent with the, um, the 10 point plan of the CARICOM on reparations. It has been amazing, it has been enlightening. You continue to be a pedagogue of the highest order, a national treasure, a regional treasure, but we want to see you for the future as well. So we need to bring this lecture tonight, this evening, to an end. But before we do so, I want to thank the community of Faisabad for wel welcoming us into the town. I want to thank who I call the Faisabad Connection, Orson Francois, Clyde Slinger, and Kenneth Charles for assisting in the arrangements for this. I want to thank a good friend and a brother of mine, a big brother of mine, the prophet of City Foss, former president and fifth president of Trinidad Tobago, Anthony Thomas Aquinas Camona for gracing us with his presence and for his comments. To all those of you, whether you're in Europe or North America, wherever, and those of you who are part of, your, of our in-person audience, I want to thank you for being here. Um, Ruby, um, Ruby, as a responsible civil society organization, will continue to do its part in helping to shape and advocate and to help fashion the case for reparations as mandated by the CARICOM heads of government in their 2013 decision. I want to thank you. Good evening. Take care. In the heart of our collective memory, a call echoes. It resonates. It is the voice of Amrobi, sparking, shaping the debate. Our distinct